Thank you very much for that introduction, Paul. For the first time today, hopefully I can give you a bit of an insight from that person that we've been talking about throughout the day. The real genuine dinky die, um, we're a producer. We're the ones at the, at the coalface that have got to put all these things together that we're talking about and try and make a business. <laughs> where do I come from or where do, we, where do we fit in? We farm a little place called Bonjean, which is just outside Toowoomba on the central Darling Downs in Queensland. We're actually a little unusual in the cotton industry in that we come from that 7% component of the industry, which is the rain grown component, and that we try and challenge with, with the weather to produce our crop. It's a family farm run by my, my wife and myself. We manage about 800 hectares of our own farming land and about 400 hectares for, for other participants in the industry. So we're embracing, again, some of those things we heard this morning of changing your business model slightly to try and adapt to some of the opportunities. In our, in our business, and I don't think it's any different in any business in agriculture, we're farming moisture. It is the component that determines whether we have yield, whether we have production, or whether we don't. We've heard today from a number of speakers how we're looking at downturns, like serious, serious um, incidents to the bottom line, the profitability of farms, because we're in drought. Well, drought is a shortage of moisture. We're rain-grown producers. Why do we do it <clears throat> rather than irrigate? Well, we're lucky in that the area which we're in in Queensland, we've, we're farming a grey cracking, cracking clay, and it's able to store a fair amount of moisture. The top line, the blue line there, is essentially the long-term average rainfall for our region, and the bottom line is a stylized demand curve for the crop that we grow, which is cotton. So in our situation, we're largely able to, to match the, the crop demand with our incident rainfall. The bit we don't put on there, of course, is the variation bars, and the variation bars are greater than the average. This season, for example, we haven't had any rainfall. So there's some of the challenges. <coughs> We, we run a very strict uh, rotation on our farm. It's a two-year rotation. Um, in the first year, in October, we'll be planting cotton. All being well, in May, which is just not too many, uh, two months away, we'll be harvesting that cotton. Um, we'll turn that... Now, cotton is a perennial crop. We, in Australia or around the world, actually try and grow it as an annual crop. So at the end of that crop cycle, we because it doesn't perform very well the second time round if you try and perenniate it. So we destroy the crop at the end of that first crop cycle, reintroduce it. So straight after picking, we'll destroy that crop and we turn it around in our situation immediately back into a wheat crop. Now we do that for a whole host of reasons in that cotton being a, a, a tap-rooted crop, it searches for moisture in a certain way. Wheat's a fibrous rooted crop, so it's, it's a different crop structure totally different way of, of behaviour. So in June, we put it back to wheat, we harvest that wheat in November. We then carry that country through, and that's not a good photo because it should be a wheat fallow that I'm spraying and not a bear fallow. So through that first summer, or the, or the, the, second, the first summer after we've had that crop, we're not actually putting that, that land back to crop. We're carrying it through as fallow, and we'll plant it again in October in two years time. So very strict rotation of doing that. The reason for that is that we can't really get enough rainfall to produce the yields that we'd like to get to produce the profitability in the crop and, and, the, and the quality in one year. So by doing this, we're able to store the rainfall from our first summer and use that to fill some gaps that occur in our rainfall in the second summer. Now, in essence, that's our irrigation. So. In, in, the, in the standard industry, where they're storing, storing water in either public infrastructure or their own on-farm dams to fill in those moisture requirements in the crop, we're trying to do it by storing moisture in our soil to fill in the gaps later in the life. Other things that happen is, well, one of the reasons why we, we use wheat stubble is that the area that we farm in, we do suffer from beneficial overland flow water. Now, what that means is every now and then it does rain, it'll rain enough that the, that the water moves across our land. Now, that's a fallow from two years ago. 
that's beneficial to me. That produced that's that's produced this year's crop. So nature's done that for me. It's one of the one of the advantages we have in that region. We take advantage of it. The reason one of the other reasons for growing that wheat in there is that stubble is able to hold that soil up, so it's not able to move and uh, erode during that flooding event. <laughs> now I'll move on from from some of our own crop into some of the industry part. Now. The crop that we grow on our farm mirrors what the, what the Australian industry has done in that we're producing a, a fully GM crop. And if we look, so the, the crop we grow currently is what's known as a Roundup, a, a um, Bolgard Roundup Ready crop. So it, it, it's carrying two genes for um, control of pests. So if we look at what's happened with the total Australian crop there, is that since the mid-90s, we, we were certainly an, a, an industry at, at the turnaround. We had some issues. We were able to grasp that GM technology at the time. It wasn't probably as great as we liked at the beginning, but it's certainly grown with us over time. And we see there now that the Australian crop is essentially 90% GM back crop and since the early 2000s, we've also had herbicide-tolerant traits in there as well. Now, one of the issues we had in the 90s certainly was that one of those social licences. We were not a very, very good neighbour, um, essentially because of um, insect pests and insecticide use. By grasping that GM technology, what have we been able to do? I think we've actually been able to grasp a social licence to exist and if we look at those curves there of insecticide use over time, both, and the interesting thing there, not only have we been able to reduce our insecticide usage in our GM crops, because that's, that get, that's a given, but also there, if we look at the, at the purple, purple line, by taking that pressure off in, a whole, in, our, in our majority crop, we've been able to reduce our reliance on insecticides in our conventional crop, because there is still a, still a percentage of the crop that's grown in a conventional manner. So we've been able to take the pressure off that because we're not intervening and causing near as much intervention in the environment. So very big pluses for us over time. These technologies come at a cost that you do need to be regimented. So they've been very successful. We're at that 90% market share. The problem that, that comes is when you get of any product that when you get to a dominant market position or whatever, you, you leave yourself open to issues. So resistance to that insecticide gene or insect gene is certainly the one that the one I'd, or problem that was identified right from the word go as being key um, to the longevity of our products. Now Australia, through um, cooperation between both our commercial partners and the industry, has grasped a, um, a management plan. So by using these technologies, we as growers agree and sign on to a management. Now, one of those things is a refuge crop. Doesn't sound like much, but between five and 10% of our cropped area is grown to a non-productive a non crop. On the right-hand side there, it's a, it's a conventional cotton crop unsprayed. So that's what, can ha that's what we like to see is happening. That's been total there's no fruit on that crop. It's been totally eaten out by inse insects. The whole, the whole theory behind that is there'll be insects produced out of there which haven't been exposed to our technology. They'll mate with those from the, from the treated material to dilute that in the environment. Simple, how has it been successful? Well, I think the measure is that in Australia, we've had GM technology for in the order of 20 years. It's been in the world for possibly 20 years. Currently, Australia is the only, touch wood, um, industry that hasn't run into insecticide resistance issues with these genes to date. So the rest of the world now is looking at what we've done in Australia, and that's just an adoption. There's been that, that adoption of industry R&D. We've talked about the development of R&D, its importance to the industry. Here's a clear example where at the farm level, it's been very, very important to us. It takes some regimentation. As growers, we whinge and we complain and we hate doing it but it allows us to continue to produce year in, year out. It's a high input cost, in, input crop. 
So twice every week we have a trained agronomist that's in our crop. Think of him in society, that's our GP. Well, he comes, we pay him a fee, he comes to us twice each week so that he's out there in the crop keeping an eye on what's happening so that if we do need to make management decisions on anything, we're making it with information that's available. So this guy here, he's looking at, for crop growth, he's looking for insects, he's looking at, at how that crop is producing. Similarly, in water, we're a crop that, that uh, utilises water. Certainly in the irrigation crop, which is the majority of the industry, that water's not applied simply because we've got water to apply. It's out there, it, it's put on because it's needed. So in most fields, you'll find some form of measuring device out in that field. This one's, well, getting somewhere near like, it's able to, it's in the field, it's logging back to a base by radio of, of what the crop's water use, whether it requires irrigation. I can see one of our re key researchers in the room who's taking it to the next step where she's working on real time um, scheduling of whether that irrigation water is required. Again, a key use of research at the production level to try and refine those input costs that we work with. No point producing it if nobody wants it. And the key, and if I, if I take up a lead from Caroline's comments earlier, there is a lot of cotton in China. It is a concern. But one of the key things in, in the cotton fibre is that, like all things in life, people like to produce a, a, a fabric at least cost. Now, what they do in that situation is they'll take 80% 80, 80 of, of reasonably low quality cotton that's, that's a bit basic, and they'll add in some good quality stuff that, that cost them a higher price to, to average up that yarn to, to produce a better fabric. The unknown in those, in those numbers in China, of course, is how much is high quality. What the Australian industry is, is, has tried to do, and we made the conscious decision in the mid-90s, is to move our industry into the quality end of the world market. We're not set up to produce volume at low price. The Australian economy is not in that business. We, we've made a conscious decision that we wanted to be in the quality end, and to that end, if we look at, look at that graph over time, and again, this is a, a clear example of the, of the value of research and development in, the, in your industry. We've been able to move the length of our fibre. So the longer the fibre that we can produce, the better, better value it is to the spinner. He, he wants a longer fibre. He wants that fibre to be a little stronger so that he can, the reason for that is he wants to spin it thinner and faster. Now, if, he can, if it's got strength, he can spin it thinner, he can spin it faster, it doesn't break. Therefore, he doesn't need as much labour in his factory in that spinning process. It all comes down to that cost of production. So the industry's made that constant change uh, decision to move in that area. So quality's gone that way. We've been very lucky at the same time that we've been able to produce yield to go in the same direction. So, we look at our, our irrigated yields have moved dramatically over time. The slide I, won't, I haven't got there is also at that same time, we're producing those yields with less water per production unit at the same time. So not only have we been able to manage to increase our yields, but we've been able to do that more efficiently. And if somebody was in the productivity session just before, where we see that the, the, the reducing percentage of water that's available to agriculture in the world, that's an issue that we have. We've talked all day today about increasing productivity and increasing production, but we've got to do it with less and less water. So the Australian industry has been able to, to bring yield forward and at the same time, that efficiency. Into the world market. We're in that quality end of the business. I look at this slide and I ask a question. If we look at the, the light blue background, that's the t essentially the total growth of world population. The dark blue bars is the growth of world fibre or natural fibres within that. So that's essentially no, total, total fibre production. The one that's scary, I guess, is the, the heavy maroon lines at the bottom, which is world cotton production versus the, the, that higher socioeconomic component of the world population. So, 
cotton's we've we've positioned ourselves into this quality business but we're also that's putting us into that area of that higher socioeconomic it, it's worth a little more the growth is in the lower socioeconomics have we gone the right way who knows it's a good question in terms of, of exports we're producing a fiber that the world wants good or bad 70% of Australia's, well, Australia essentially exports 100% of our production. 70% of that currently is finding a home in China. That's great in that it's finding a home. It's at, it's at a price that's acceptable to both Australian growers and to the Chinese producer. Now, as Caroline's identified, China's perhaps pulling back in its total uh, imports. Now, that's, that scares us, I guess. The thing that's probably helping us a little is if we look at the bottom spotted red line, and that represents Australia's percentage of Chinese imports. The important thing there is that even though China's importing less and less cotton over time, Australia's getting a higher and higher percentage of it, primarily because we've positioned ourselves into that quality end of the business. So they've got, they've got a lot of low quality cotton, they want some really good quality cotton to mix with it to make a better fibre. That's been successful for us to date. We hope that that's, that will continue to work in our favour in, in, in years going forward. At the end of the day, it's, it's all about fibre production, or fibre production and, and demand. And we're seeing more and more um, demand from, from the world because at the end of the day, fibre is controlled by brand owners to some extent. So the, the final fabric, it's the brand owners that are having the say on what they want. Now, we've, we're getting a lot of brand owners now wanting sustainable production. They're wanting environmentally responsible cotton. One of the good things that Australia's done over the time is we've, we've set up back in the mid-90s a best management practice program within our industry. So we've been able to benchmark what is best, best practice. We've got the majority of our growers in the industry performing at the best performance levels for each of the components that go into their management of their crop. It, it seems a far, a far cry from a simple farmer to say that why I should be doing things at best management practice level when at the end of the day, and I had a, a, an email, or seen an email last week from, from a European brand owner saying, I want cotton, but it has to be sustainable. It has to be best practice. Now, to that end, we're now seeing the Australian industry cashing in on and, and becoming part of some of these, these world programs for fibres. So that it, it's a real turnaround, I guess, from a, from a fibre or from an industry that 20 years ago, we probably didn't have the cleanest and greenest record. I think we've come a long way. We're now able to position ourselves into taking some of these market shares. At the same level, while we're doing all that, we're trying to make a profit at the grower level. As growers, our challenge is to manipulate those things that we're able to manage to produce a profit. There shouldn't be any crime in that, and a profit to, to me is that I've spent a little bit less than what I've, I've, I've got more in than what I've put out. So a profit at the end of the day is what it's all about. If we're able to do it sustainably and continue our position in the world market, I think we're on the right track. Thank you.